Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, who is in Bandung, uh, Indonesia, and good afternoon, good evening for everyone around the world who has been participate, uh, participated in this uh, summer school. So today, uh, I'm as a chair of this session. Uh, we will uh, discuss about the introduction to dark matter. So before that, uh, maybe I need to introduce myself again, uh, in, uh, just in case some of you missed uh, uh, several lectures yesterday and previous uh, days. Okay, my name is Anton Timur Jalani. Uh, I'm from uh, Institute of Technology Bandung. So in this session, uh, I would like to, uh, yeah, I will be moderated uh, this uh, lecture. So today, uh, the lecture will be delivered by uh, Dr. Rernet uh, Hesti uh, Ratnotri Wulandari. Uh, she is uh, from uh, Institute of Technology Bandung. So as you, as uh, for your information, uh, uh, she is the real boss of uh, this uh, summer school. So. Why I, I said that uh, she is the real boss for this uh, summer school? Because uh, she, uh, her uh, research field, uh, her research uh, interests uh, are about uh, dark matter sources, searches, uh, neutron astrophysics, and also about the uh, galactic astronomy. And uh, she was graduated from Institute of Technology Bandung and she got a PhD from uh, University of München, uh, Germany. And also after that, uh, she took a postdoc uh, in uh, University of München. And maybe uh, I will welcome uh, Dr. Hesti to present her talk today, please. Okay, thank you, Anton, for introducing me. Do I look bossy, guys? <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. I will start by sharing my screen now. Just a second. Okay. Yes, there some. Maybe I should. Okay, I'd like to stop my video. <clears throat> okay, do you see my slides? Yes, we can see. Okay, let's start. So, good morning again, everybody. As Anton said, I'm from ITB. So I will, uh, I will be giving an introduction to dark matter. Since this is an introduction and not a review talk, it is not meant to cover a complete aspect in the topic of dark matter. But instead, I will assure you to some basic issues in order to prepare you for the next lectures that will be more advanced and detailed. Okay, I will start by showing you a pie diagram here that describes the matter energy budget. It's a standard model of contemporary cosmology that is lambda CDM. This model basically says that we live in a double dark universe in which dark energy in the form of cosmological constant or lambda and dark matter are the dominant components. Whereas baryonic matter contributes only 5% of the total matter energy budget of the universe. And radiation is negligible. Baryons are normal matter that consists of protons and neutrons and absorb 
or emits electromagnetic radiation. From this 5%, only one-fifth is inventoried in the form of stars, galaxies, and gas. In this lecture, I will concentrate on this 27% form of matter that is non-baryonic. So this is the plan of my talk. I will start with what dark matter is, and then we'll continue with the evidence for dark matter, candidates, detection, and then challenges to cold dark matter, alternatives to dark matter, and finally, I will conclude. So what is dark matter? Let us compare it with something that is not dark matter, namely, luminous or visible matter. Any matter detectable by electron, electromagnetic detectors or any matter that absorb or emit electromagnetic radiation in any wavelength, either radio, visual, infrared, etc., is called luminous. It is baryonic, composed of protons, neutrons, just like you and me. We often call it normal matter. As we have seen in my previous slide, baryonic component contributes only 5% to the total matter energy budget of the universe. This 5% or this constraint is set by Big Bang nucleosynthesis and CMB observations. However, as I said, only 1% that have been inventoried. So we are left with 5% gap that usually attributed to baryonic dark matter. Namely, baryons that are too faint to be detected by our current technology. But see, for example, a recent census of baryons in the universe from localized fast gamma rivers by McWard et al. 2020, they determined electron column density along its line of sight to the radio bursts at several red shifts and accounts for every ionized baryons in the line of sight. And they end up with omega baryon of 0.05 or 5%. So maybe we have already full inventory of baryons. Although confirmations are always needed as is common in science. So in contrast, to luminous matter, dark matter is non-luminous, does not emit or absorb electromagnetic radiation, and so far, its existence is suggested by gravitational effects on luminous matter. The evidence for dark matter is piled up, ranging from galaxy scale up to cluster scale, and the universe as a whole. We will go through this in the next slide. Let's start with the galaxy scale. On the galaxy scale, the evidence for dark matter can be summarized as the mismatch between luminous mass and the gravitational or the total mass of galaxies. How can we weigh a galaxy? This is done basically by equating gravitational force with centripetal force here. Yeah. So, so that we obtain mass enclosed by radius r from the center of galaxy. So basically, we need to measure rotation curve or phi as a function of r in order to determine gravitational mass. 
But how can we do that? Rotation curve of a galaxy is obtained by measuring of orbital speeds of objects at different radius from the center of galaxy. By doing spectroscopy, spectroscopic measurement, in which we measure Doppler shift caused by motion of objects in the galaxy, we measure radial or line of sight velocity. If an object is approaching us, here, yeah. the wavelength of light from the object is blue shifted, whereas a red shift is expected if an object is moving away from us. So the radial velocity is proportional to the shift of the wavelength. Here on the left is a rotating disk viewed from above or with incline, inclination zero. The azimuth, azimuth angle phi measured, is measured in the display that gives a star's position in its orbit here. Yeah. But more often, we see galaxies in inclination, where the inclination angle I measures the angle between our line of sight and the normal direction of the galaxy plane. In principle, inclination can be determined, determined as a ratio between the minor axis to the major axis of the galaxy. The radial velocity that we measure is actually a summation of two components. Namely, the velocity of the galaxy as a system, which is none other than the velocity of the galaxy center, and a contribution of the orbital velocity in the direction of our line of sight. So from this, we can obtain orbital velocity at any radius r from the center. How do rotation curves of galaxies look like compared to that of solar system here. Yeah. In the solar system, 99.8% of mass resides in the sun. And the rest is split between planets, asteroids, and all other smaller objects. So without feeling guilty, we can say that solar system's mass is not a function of radius from the sun. Our m is constant, with it, uh, not a function of radius. And since m is constant, the rotational velocity drops proportionally with r to the minus half. This form of rotation curve is known as Keplerian, since this is um, observed in the way planets orbit the sun. Now let's see what the case is. Now let's see what the case is in the uh, galaxies, especially spiral galaxies. Surface brightness of the disk of spiral galaxies fall off exponentially, as shown here in this equation. Rd here 
is a characteristic scale that indicates how fast brightness falls or falls off with radius. For our galaxy, for example, RD is 4 kiloparsec. And for M31, it is 6 kiloparsec. Meaning that the uh, surface brightness of Milky Way fall off, falls off faster with radius compared to M31. If we assume that distributions of mass in the galaxies follow the distribution of light, then by multiplying surface brightness with mass to light ratio or M over L, we obtain that mass distribution falls off also exponentially, just like surface brightness. It means that after several RDs, it is expected that mass is constant with radius. And we end up with V that falls off as function of R to the power of minus half. So the rotation curve of galaxies should be Keplerian in the outer radius of galaxies. However, observational rotation curves of galaxies, including our own, do not show Keplerian decline at outer radii but instead they tend to be flat, as shown here in the uh, picture. On the right is basically the sketch of rotation curve that we expect compared to what is observed. From the relation of V to, to M here, we conclude that in order to have a flat or constant V, we need to have mass distribution that varies linearly with R. Here, for example, is the rotation curve of NGC 6503, a dwarf SC spiral galaxy that has negligible bulge component. This is the observed rotation curve. We cannot reproduce it by decomposing this observed rotation curve into contribution of visible components only, namely the stellar disk and the gas disk. The same thing for NGC 7331, a massive SP spiral with significant bulge component. The observed rotation curve cannot be decomposed into visible Bolts, stellar disk, and gas. But if we add a dark halo component here and here, the observed rotation curves are reproduced nicely. So the discrepancies between the expected and the observed rotation curves can be accounted for by adding a halo, a dark halo surrounding the galaxy. This figure here depicts how the luminous component of a galaxy is embedded in a huge halo of dark matter.
Moving to galaxy cluster scale, the need of dark matter is also suggested from comparison of the luminous mass to the total mass. I will be discussing three methods to calculate clusters uh, total mass. The first method is involving cluster dynamics in which we measure velocity dispersions of galaxies in the cluster. This method was applied for coma, for coma cluster in 1930s by Fritz Zwicky. And applying virial theorem to the cluster, it is expected that two times kinetic energy plus potential energy equals to zero. Or that kinetic energy should be equals to minus half the potential energy to keep the cluster stable. The total mass from this relation, we can get the total mass of the cluster here. However, Chiki found that the total mass is far exceeding the luminous mass in the form of galaxies. The kinetic energy was, was much higher than the potential energy. So the galaxies in coma cluster simply move too fast that they could fly apart. Therefore, a large additional gravitational mass is needed to prevent the system from breaking up, breaking up. And it was Zwicky who first coined the term dark matter or dunkel matter in German for the missing mass. It is also possible to determine, to determine the galaxy cluster's total mass from X-ray observations. The use of X-ray for studies of galaxy clusters started in 1970s. Assuming that hydrostatic equilibrium condition is met in a cluster, its total mass can be determined from observation of temperature and density profiles here. It is then known that clusters harbor a large amount of intracluster hot gas with temperature of 10 to 100 million Kelvin and with mass that reaching five times galaxy mass or mass in the form of galaxies. But this addition is still not sufficient to account for the missing mass in the clusters. It is now suggested that typically 80 to 85 percent of the total matter in the uh, clusters is in the form of dark matter. The last method to determine clusters' total mass I want to discuss is through observation of gravitational lensing. General relativity says that mass curves space-time. So light follows the curvature of space-time and should dip and curve in the presence of massive objects. This Bending of light gives rise to important phenomena called gravitational lensing that is illustrated here, in which massive objects such as galaxy clusters act as lens. And galaxy clusters, in this case, bending light, 
from a distant galaxy producing multiple but distorted images of the original galaxy. Using gravitational lensing, we can determine total mass of the lens. This is a typical sketch of gravitational lensing system. A mass concentration is located at the distance dl from the observer here. This lens deflects the light rays coming from source at distance ds. So you can uh, prove that from the geometry we have this relation here. Alpha with head here is a defect deflection angle, deflection angle of light that uh, we learn from general general relativity. And by defining the reduced deflection angle alpha alpha is alpha is here given here, we get this relation beta equal to theta minus alpha, known as lensing uh, or lens equation. This is lens equation. If the observer lens and the source are in perfect alignment, we would have a ring-shaped image known as Einstein ring with Einstein radius given by this equation. So we see here we have M. Okay. So in strong gravitational lensing, source distortions are noticeable as in the case of cluster Abel uh, 370 at red tip 0.375. Entangled here among galaxies, we see blue arcs and arclets. They are actually distorted images of galaxies behind the cluster. And mass calculation gives a mass inside Einstein radius of around three times 10 to the 14 solar mass. With luminosity of some 10 to the 11 uh, solar luminosity, we obtain a mass to light ratio of 1000 uh, mass to light ratio of uh, the sun. So this indicates a large amount of dark matter. In a weak lensing, source distortion is small, only a few percent. A large number of sources needed to be analyzed to find a coherent distortions. Weak lensing can be used to reconstruct the mass distribution in a cluster, particularly the distribution of uh, dark matter. More on gravitational lensing will be discussed by Dr. Anton Jailani this afternoon. He is the expert on this thing. So, on the cosmological scale, we need um, the need for dark matter is indicated by the observations of CMB. CMB is primordial radiation coming to us from all directions in the sky and is the oldest electromagnetic courier that brings information about early universe to us. 
CMB exhibits almost a perfect black body spectrum of temperature of 2.73 Kelvin that corresponds to microwave range of wavelength. CMB originates from the last scattering era when the universe was about 380,000 years old. And it exhibits temperature fluctuation in the order of 10 to the minus 5. From statistical analysis of the, of the fluctuations, we can construct a power spectrum, which is basically shows temperature fluctuation on different angular scale. So here, for example, this is the uh, data and on um, in blue line is the um, best fit with lambda CDM model. CMB power spectrum is like a gold mine. We gain many information on cosmological parameters, including curvature of the universe. So from CMB, for example, we know that we live in a flat universe. CMB also tells us about the contents of the universe. The most recent constraints on some cosmological parameters given by uh, Planck 2018 is given here for omega lambda, omega matter, and uh, omega cold dark matter times uh, reduced Hubble uh, constant square, and also variant times h square. Note here that the, the density parameter of non-baryonic matter is around six times that of baryonic. And in addition, I will uh, discuss about the constraint on baryon density, which is given by Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So BBN is synthesis of light elements nuclei during the first few minutes after Big Bang. The abundance of primordial light is dependent on the value of baryon, baryon density, I mean, and also on Hubble constant. And we see here the observation of deuterium abundance gives uh, omega baryon times its uh, square um, 0.02, consistent with CMB result. And using its O uh, or uh, Hubble constant of, uh, reduced Hubble constant of 0.6, 68, we end up with omega baryon of 0 0.0, practically 0 0.05. Yeah. But we learned that omega matter is 0 0.31, so there's a gap here that should be uh, non baryonic matter or dark matter. Yeah, that might the uh, non baryonic non dark matter. The last evidence on cosmological scale that I would like to mention is the large-scale large -scale structure of the universe. 
On large scale, the universe displays coherent structure with galaxies residing in groups and clusters which lie at the intersection maybe it's too small, uh, lie at the intersection of long filaments of galaxies and we see also vast regions of relatively empty space known as void that contain very few galaxies this observed large scale structure depends both on cosmological parameters and also on the formation and evolution of galaxies on the right here this figure shows snapshots of simulated large-scale uh, large structure. So time goes forward from here, here, and then here, yeah? Here, <clears throat> here is uh, the situation now that we can compare with uh, observation. So this figure or this simulation shows not only that cold dark matter is crucial for the formation of large scale structure, but also that dark matter should be cold or non-relativistic at the epoch of galaxy formation. Otherwise, the structure now would be too smooth and not like what we see. Okay, so far for the evidence from astronomy or astronomical observations. Now, what dark matter can be? Candidates for dark matter. In fact, we know only little about dark matter. It is non-baryonic, it is cold, it is cosmologically stable with lifetime far longer than the age of the universe. It is dark or electrically neutral. Otherwise, we can see it through electromagnetic uh, detector. It is collisionless, which is evident from uh, collisions of uh, clusters. And also, it has to give correct relic density or gives omega dark matter this much. Now let's see what we have. So there are many candidates of dark matter that have been uh, proposed. We can classify candidates in different ways. A major classification of dark matter is based on its temperature or velocity at the time of galaxy formation. Hot dark matter was relativistic at the time of galaxy formation and therefore hindered the formation of the smallest objects by streaming out of the forming structure. A typical hot dark matter particle is a standard model like neutrino. Cold dark matter, on the other hand, was relative was non-relativistic at the time of galaxy formation, and thus was able to collapse effectively under the action of gravity because of its negligible uh, pressure. Example of candidates are neutralinos, axions, Wimsilla, etc. Warm dark matter is um, an intermediate case between hot and cold dark matter. It is, uh, is semi-relativistic at the time of galaxy formation. 
And examples are KEV mass cell neutrinos, graphitinos, and maybe other particles. Now the classification is based on production mechanism. So we have thermal relics and non-thermal relics. Thermal relic candidates were in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. Uh, candidates in this class are neutrinos, neutralinos, and other uh, and most other WIMS uh, particles. Non-thermal relics were produced by non-thermal mechanism and never had the chance of reaching uh, thermal equilibrium in the early universe. Axions and Wimsillas fall into this category. So we have so many candidates, but the only candidates that, we, that are known to exist are the standard model neutrinos or light neutrinos. We know from oscillation experiments that neutrinos, or at least some neutrinos, have mass. However, the upper limit on density parameter of neutrinos forbids currently known neutrinos from being the major constituents of dark matter. Besides, neutrinos belong to hot dark matter that were relativistic at epoch of galaxy formation and therefore suppress the formation of large scale structure. So the neutrino cannot, our standard model neutrino cannot be, uh, cannot contribute many to the, to the budget that we need. Now we will, uh, briefly discuss three cold dark matter candidates which are well motivated. What, what do we mean by uh, well motivated? It means that they have been proposed to solve problems in principles related to unrelated, I mean unrelated to dark matter. So it is, or it was proposed for something else, for some problem in particle physics, and not tailor-made for the need of dark matter. And it is called well-motivated because their properties can be computed within a well-defined particle physics model that we have. The three candidates that I would like uh, to mention here are WIMS, Axion, and Sterile Neutrinos. WIM is a broad class of massive, weakly interacting net natural particles that formed during Big Bang. It covers a mass of 1 GeV to 1 TeV. And there are hundreds of particles in, in this class. The favorite candidate for WIMS are neutralinos, which is the lightest particle, 20 to 1000 GeV, heavier than a proton, and stable in supersymmetry model. The heavier CC particles are unstable and decay. Neutron, you know, is the lightest. Axions are neutral, spin zero, small mass particles with mass in the order of a micro to milli electron volt. Axions are hypothesized over hypothesized the size to resolve strong CP problem in uh, quantum chronodyna chromodynamics. 
and st stable neutrinos are proposed additional neutrino flavors to explain certain discrepancies in earlier neutrino experiments, such as in LSND. However, as the name would suggest, sterile, sterile uh, neutrino do not interact with other matter through weak force. This makes uh, sterile neutrinos Uh, difficult or impossible to directly detect as they can only be observed uh, through their mixing with other neutrino flavors. I will not go <laughs> further uh, into this. More on particle dark matter will be discussed by Dr. Primulando tomorrow. And uh, further discussion will be concentrated on beams. WIMS is a favorite candidate for some reasons. I already mentioned that it is based on a well-motivated theory and another important reason called uh, a WIMS miracle I would like to discuss here now. Now, consider some time in the early universe when the temperature is high enough and suppose that WIMS interact through this reaction. The forward reaction is WIM annihilation and the backward reaction is WIM, WIMS creation. Suppose that uh, particles are in thermal and chemical equilibrium, meaning that they share the same temperature and that the reaction in both directions are in equilibrium. In equilibrium, the evolution of the number density of WIMS is given by Boltzmann equation. The first term on the right hand, uh, on the right hand side accounts for dilution in the WIM density with number density due to expansion of the universe. So H here is Hubble parameter that describes uh, the expansion rate of the universe. And the terms here come from WIM annihilation and creation uh, reaction. The figure here is showing you the evolution of co-moving number density of WIMS as a function of m over t, which is a proxy of time, basically. The solid curve shows number density of WIMS in equilibrium. When the temperature of the universe drops below the wind mass, there will be not enough energy for wind creation. So the reaction at the backward reaction will be impossible anymore and not possible anymore. So the reaction goes forward practically. So, um, in the direction of beam annihilation. And when the reaction rate, gamma, which is equal, equal to uh, thermally average cross-section times beam density, beam number density. So when uh, gamma or reaction rate falls off below Hubble, Hubble uh, parameter or the rate of the expansion, expansion of the universe, the reaction then will practically insignificant. 
and the number density of WIMS precisal or is fixed to constant as shown here in the test line. The relic density today is given by this equation here. So the higher the, the cross section, the smaller the relic density we get. And in this equation, if we put a cross section for weak scale interaction, we get the correct order for the relic density we need for dark matter. And since the interaction is in the weak scale, it is accessible for experiments. So this is called miracle. It's like by one get to free. Since WIMS are theoretically well motivated and naturally give the correct relic density and also testable or accessible by experiments. So what can we ask more? Okay, so far we have been discussing how the existence of dark matter is inferred from various astronomical observations. Now we are moving to the efforts that astroparticle physicists have been put forward to detect dark matter particles. Well, in fact, detecting dark matter is very challenging. There are basically three strategies as shown in this diagram, depending on the direction we look. Looking from bottom up, we produce dark matter or dark matter particles from standard particles. This is called uh, uh, production. This method is implied in large colliders. And if we look from left to right, we have direct detection in which we look for effects on standard model particles induced by their interaction with dark matter. From top to bottom, we have indirect direction. Um, uh, sorry, indirect detection or annihilation, in which we look for standard model particles emerging from dark matter annihilation. Sorry. In colliders, dark matter particles are detected, are detected from energy and momentum imbalance in particle collisions. In direct detection or direct search experiments, we detect dark matter nucleon interactions directly at the locus of interaction. The signatures of detection would be nuclei recoils or nuclei recoil energy of some KEV and other particles such as photons and phonons. In indirect detection, we look for annihilation products from neutralino and anti-neutralino. The products are such as neutrino, gamma rays, 
and antiparticles such as positron or antiproton. This, this picture uh, showing you at last experiment at a large hadron collider. Some theories predict uh, some theories predict that uh, uh, dark matter can be produced by high energy proton proton collisions. If produced, dark matter would escape the detector unseen. But jets of standard model particles would be detected, providing detectable signals. Uh, so far, no sign of dark matter seen, but uh, already limits on the mass and cross-section uh, is obtained or set. Here are some examples of indirect search experiments. Hess and Fermi are among gamma rays detectors. AMS, antimatter search, AMS, and Pamela are looking for antimatter. S cube in South Pole is an example of neutrino telescope. I will not go further into this. More on the indirect detection will be given by Dr. Emmanuel Mulang next week. Now move to direct sources, which I will uh, a little uh, detail compared to the other uh, methods. Dozens of uh, direct detection experiments are currently running worldwide as shown here on the, on the uh, map. They employ, they are employing different technologies and different detectors. So more on uh, Direct searches, um, you will hear next week in Professor Jochum's lecture. Among many direct detection experiments, so far only Dama Libra that persistently reports annual modulation in the signal, in the uh, event rates they measure. Dama is located in Gran Sasso underground lab in Italy using natrium iodide as detectors. And this figure here explains how such a modulation in the event rate is expected. Suppose we have VIM in this uh, that uh, velocity in this direction and our sun is moving in the opposite direction in the galactic frame and the earth revolves the sun in this direction. To get the event rates in our detector we have to change the wind velocity from galactic frame to earth frame. So we subtract wind velocity with earth velocity in galactic frame. But the earth velocity is changes, uh, the earth velocity changes periodically because the earth revolves the sun, yeah? So uh, the velocity is given here. This result in the variation of the event rates in our detector. The maximum event rate is expected on the 2nd of June. And this is what Dama claims to see, second June, second June, etc. 
Unfortunately, the results of Dama Libra is not supported by other direct searches experiments because they see no results or no show results. Even experiments that try to, replic to replicate Dama setup and detectors. This figure here shows you exclusion plots of several direct search experiments. On the horizontal axis is WIMAS, and on the vertical axis is cross-section for WIM nucleon interaction. Uh, solid lines are sensitivities of current experiments, while desk lines are sensitivities projected by future experiments. So what an, an exclusion plot tells us? An exclusion plot basically tells us that in the case of no-show result, the corresponding experiment excludes parameter space above the plot. And in the case of a positive detection or detection of events that cannot be accounted for backgrounds, we can draw a region of allowed parameter. Most background in direct searches are electromagnetic namely electrons and photons. Current experiments have developed strategies and are good at suppressing this kind of backgrounds. However, we see here that soon direct detection or direct detection experiments would hit the so-called neutrino uh, floor, neutrino floor, below which the detectors start to be sensitive to atmospheric and diffuse supernova background neutrinos. Scattering neutrinos of detector nuclei mimic WIMS scatterings. Therefore, those neutrinos are background sources for direct detection experiment in the future. That will be very hard to get rid of. Okay, now let's move to the challenges to cold dark matter. Despite support from various astronomical observations, cold dark matter faces some challenges. The first problem is known as missing satellite problem. That broadly refers to the overabundance of CDM subhalos or dwarf galaxies compared to satellite galaxies known to exist in the local group. For example, we have, uh, we observed so far 50 satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, but CDM predict thousands subhalos for Milky Way. The second problem is core cast problem. The central regions of dark matter dominated galaxies, as inferred from rotation curves, tend to be both less dense and less cuspy than predicted for standard lambda CDM halos. Shown here are rotation curves 
of two dwarf galaxies, DDO126 and DDO43, both fit better with Burkert with Burkert profile or Burkert halo with core profile. This is Burkert profile. Rather than Caspi and FW, Navarro Frank White, hello profile. So this is a rotation curve with an FW, and in blue is the Burkert uh, profile. And an FW is Caspi, Burkert is, uh, uh, has core. This raises an important uh, question whether baryonic feedback alters the structure of dark matter halos, or maybe the dark matter are self interacting. Now, move to the alternatives of dark matter. So, the Existence of dark matter inferred so far from gravitational effects on luminous objects. But despite decades of trying, we are yet to detect dark matter using interactions other than gravity. So in up, uh, astronomical observations, we see only uh, the effect of uh, gravitational interaction of dark matter with luminous matter. So as long as it has not found, it is still justified to doubt its existence. It is natural to ask whether we can get rid of dark matter by positing some modification of the behavior of gravity. So here, for example, uh, some modified uh, gravity theory. The famous one is MON, proposed by Milgram in 1980s. We have here also TEFES, that stands for Tensor Vector Scalar Gravity, developed by Bekenstein in 2004. Tefes is a relativistic generalization of MON. There's also MOP, modified gravity, with uh, that is a scalar tensor vector theory of gravity propo proposed by John Moffat. Uh, MOP phenomena phenomenologically phenomenologically predicts newtonian gravity at the short range and a newton like newtonian like gravity with an enhanced value of gravitational constant at infinity and an intermediate uh, transitional region, so to say. Emergent gravity proposed by Berlinda, who considers gravity as an emergent force, not the fundamental force of nature. It is an emergent property of space. In the next slide, I will discuss briefly only about more because more on topic of alternatives to dark matter will be discussed by Professor Lely next, next week. MON is a phenomenological modification of the Newtonian acceleration law. The idea is that Newtonian gravity breaks down below a certain limit value for the acceleration of gravity. The limit is A0, uh, A0 here, A0. So in the Newtonian regime, in which 
uh, J is much higher than A0, we have the normal Newtonian expression for gravitational acceleration. But in the Mondian regime, where G is weak, gravitational acceleration is modified and fulfill this relation. The value of A0 is given here. And by equating centripetal acceleration with G in Mondian regime, we get orbital speed that is constant. Therefore, the flat rotation curves in the, in the uh, outskirt region of galaxies can be explained without introducing dark matter. Well, in fact, Mon in most cases or in many cases works better than dark matter. I have to confess. In reproducing uh, rotation curves of galaxies. And there has been a constant tug war between Mon and dark matter proponents. I don't want to go into details about this since I expect Professor Lely will um, have more to say in, this, in his lecture. But I just want to mention about uh, a fantastic object called bullet cluster that is often considered as a smoking gun of dark matter and a case against Mon. The bullet cluster consists of two colliding clusters. Shown here is a composite image of three different observations, actually. The optical image show galaxies. Hot gas distribution fusion is from X-ray observation and weak lensing reveals where most of the mass is. The smaller cluster of uh, or the bullet move from left to right through the larger cluster and the collision separated hot gas from the galaxies. If mass of the colliding clusters were only baryonic, then galaxies should have followed the distribution of the hot gas, which is the dominant baryonic component with mass more than uh, five times higher than mass of the galaxies. Rather, galaxies occupy regions outside from the hot gas distribution. But, so here and here, but here in this, in these locations are exactly where most of the mass is according to weak, to weak lensing. So galaxy follows uh, where mass is, uh, where the most of uh, the mass is located. Or the galaxy follow the most dominant unseen mass that should be dark matter. Okay, my Last slide, let us conclude. Evidence for the existence of dark matter is abundant from astronomical observations. But WIMS are extremely good at hiding from detection in our experiments. However, we should let no stone left unturned and continue to look for dark matter wherever we can. 
Maybe our luck is just around the corner. But also let us open for alternatives. That is all I have to say today. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks uh, for your great talks. Uh, okay. Uh, I will invite uh, uh, the participants to ask uh, Dr. Hesti. Uh, yeah, maybe what I said before about uh, your you are the boss in the summer school has been uh, has become a trigger to participants to uh, ask you because I have checked. And there is a lot of question for you. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, maybe I will just and invite uh, Arif Nurahman from Indonesia. Uh, are you there? Okay. Yes. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. My question, sorry if my question is not so good, ma'am. Uh, why a uh, CERN detector like LIC can uh, be candidate for detect dark matter? My first question like that. Why a uh, CERN detector? Like LIC can yes. one become a candidate to detect uh, dark matter, but uh, so far uh, not fine. Maybe, maybe like that. First ah, question. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, it is uh, it's kind of um we call it production so we have uh mm -hmm. proton collisions and we expect that dark matter uh, coming from that reaction but so far we see uh, no no detection or no show but tomorrow uh, a friend of mine is expert on such things uh, will be discussed. I, I asked him uh, personally to, to talk about the production in accelerator. accelerator. Yeah. And uh, in one thing is that, as I said, we know very little about the nature of dark matter. So there are so many candidates, so many theory, and not all of them already <clears throat> tested. It's already tested, so to say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, maybe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks for uh, Arif. And then uh, I will invite uh, Howie Johannes. Uh, are you there? Howie? How? Yes, yeah. I'm there. Okay, please. Hello. Okay, yes. maybe uh, you seem that dark matter is sexual. Can't you hear me? Okay, maybe I will help her to ask you, uh, how are you, Hannes? Uh, when we say dark matter is a collisionless, can we say it is empty? Uh, no, I mean, uh, it does not dissipate energy, not like uh, gas. So gas can uh, lose energy and uh, collide with each other. But dark matter, so far as we know, it's not like that. You you can see, for example, from the bullet cluster. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move uh, to another uh, question. So, um, uh, maybe Amani Besma, yeah. are you there? Yes. Hello. Yeah, you can. Uh, so my question ask. is: uh, Does dark matter exist in every galaxy? Is it a requirement for forming galaxies? 
Uh, well, as you heard from uh, Professor Mako yesterday, the, the dark matter content of different uh, uh, morphological class is expected to be different. For example, in dwarf galaxies, it is expected that uh, it is dominated by dark matter only few uh, baryonic matter. But for uh, large galaxies, the contribution is uh, less compared to dwarf galaxy. I mean. Okay. Nice. And that we know from uh, rotation curve, from the rotation curve, or the composition of the rotation curve. Okay. Okay. For the next question uh, from Hermawan Raditya. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Please ask uh, her uh, directly. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my my questions. My question is. How much is the average velocity for of dark matter? Is it possible for reaching the speed of light, like maybe new neutrinos did? But if it could have speed of light, does it break the rule that everything that has mass shouldn't have the speed of light? Thank you. Thank you. As I said, um what we believe now is that dark matter is cold, meaning that it is non-relativistic. So is it uh, non-relativistic is small uh, velocity. Cold dark matter we have. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but in the earlier, uh, you, you have said that the, the one of the candidates of dark matter is neutrinos and if mm -hmm. if i recall the neutrinos is travel is travel at the nearest speed of light how how can those things are connected okay 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 i mentioned in my uh, uh lecture that neutrino or uh, Standard model neutrino is hot dark matter. It uh, the the limit of of the mass. Uh, so far, we, we still cannot uh, have the the absolute mass of standard model neutrino. We have only limit. Yeah, we have only limit. Um, then and the the mass is small, very small. So. Uh, as I said, it is a hot dark matter. So maybe we we have kind of mix between a hot and a cold dark matter, but dark matter must be dominated by cold dark matter. But yes, that's a, a candidate for whole hot dark matter. Thank you, doctor. Okay, uh, yeah, it's still many questions left. So, don't I worry, will invite... Anton, uh, this <laughs> is school on dark matter, and we have still many lectures on, on this topic. So, uh, don't use up all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have many, many times still. Uh, okay. Okay, maybe for a uh, question about Mon, okay. I, I will postpone it because uh, we have a uh, special lecturer uh, who will be uh, uh, given such kind of topics. And then maybe I will invite Bufaneswari. Uh, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, the presentation was uh, totally good and informative, Professor. I liked it very much. And I have a question. Uh, 
does dark matter obey the known physics uh, more precisely how are we even sure that dark matter obeys uh, laws of gravity relativity entropy etc does dark matter sorry uh, does dark matter obey the known physics non physics uh, uh, i mean that non known physics known physics yeah, Yes, yeah. Ah, non physics. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Hmm. Well, you see that uh, you mean which non physics? If it is uh, graffiti, then uh, yes, I would say. Uh, if it is standard particle physics, then most of dark matter. Uh, are non-standard particles. They are exotic. Only neutrino is the uh, is the particle candidate that we know to exist. So, am I answering your question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I have a little doubt about the uh, loss of entropy. Does that can we apply them to dark matter? Loss of entropy. In which case? To find the entropy of uh, the total universe. Like, can we uh, include the entropy of the dark matter? Uh, well, maybe it depends on the on the the particle you have because there are many 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 uh, kinds of dark matter from the less exotic to the most exotic one so so it depends on which uh, candidate thank you professor that answers my question <laughs> okay yeah. Okay, maybe a uh, last question for this uh, session. Uh, I will invite, uh, wait a minute. Uh, wait. <laughs> uh, Emir, Emir Shahreza. Yeah. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Okay, uh, my question is, uh, can we know the spin of dark matter particle? And uh, if it's known to be non-baryonic, does it mean we should exclude spin half particles? And uh, my last question is, uh, if we know that uh, dark matter is collisionless, does it mean that dark matter must be a boson particle? Uh, can I conclude like that? Thank mm. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, as I said, uh, we have many, 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 many kind of uh, particle particles proposed as dark matter candidates, uh, and those particles, or if I may say, the the well motivated candidate, they already uh, uh, proposed for something else, for something, for problems other than dark matter. So for example, axion, you have, uh, as I said, spin zero for uh, not, uh, WIMS. I think it's uh, uh, maybe spin half. Well, in principle, you can have anything as far as it is cold and uh, the, gives the relic density etc etc because we still cannot constrain the nature of dark matter so the possibilities is so many although from experiments we already exclude maybe most of them also the our favorite candidates that once considered to be uh, the most 
the most favorite, I, I would say. Okay. But in principle, like that, because we we know very little about the nature, so anything can be put, can be proposed, as long as cold, neutral, collisionless, give the correct relic density, as I said. Thank you, man. Okay, um, maybe uh, I have to stop uh, the question and answer session. Uh, yeah, before we stop this meeting, uh, as usual, we, we will invite you to take a picture together. Please uh, to turn your uh, videos on. Okay, uh, are you ready everyone? Okay. Okay, I will start to take a picture for slides one, slide one. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, next slide. Okay. Slide two. Okay, done. Okay, thank you uh, everyone for a uh, good discussion and good atmosphere in uh, this season, uh, session. And please give a big applause for our speakers today. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hasti and Dr. Anton. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hasti. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Hasti. Bye. Bye.